Hi, welcome to the next in our series of Practical Electromagnetic for Engineers. It turns out that the electric field uh, depends somewhat on the material you're working with. Uh, the electric field in vacuum and the electric material in a plastic material, for example, may be different, and there are some subtle distinctions between the two that we're going to explore in today's lecture. But the only materials we're going to be talking about are insulators, a type of material we call dielectrics. So we've spent a fair amount of time considering a charge, let's call this a charge Q down here in free space, and we know that it creates an electric field which is given by a vector field we call E. Essentially at every point in space we measure it which is determined by, by a vector R sub M. So if, of course R comes in, R sub M comes out here to some point we want to measure. Um, we know when we, we get the expression from Coulomb's law that the electric field depends on this term epsilon we said was a proportionality constant. Essentially it relates the actual electric field in, in some kind of MKS unit system to, to do things and balance things out. The question is um, why don't we just put in a number? Uh, what if R sub M is inside some block of material? It turns out that the properties of this material are generally represented by epsilon, and that's why we have a variable epsilon here rather than just some number. Um, because if we use a different material, we have to change the value of this proportionality constant. So, so why does this happen, and what implications does it have for working with electromagnetic stuff? In order to better understand this, uh, we need to zoom in. We need to sort of get a microscope and zoom in very closely to look down on the scale of individuals, atom, the individual atoms or molecules that make up this material. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we zoom in far enough to this material and take a, a somewhat simplistic view, and then the reality is, of course, much more complicated, we know this material is made up of individual atoms or molecules. And at the center of each of these atoms and molecules, there's a nucleus. And this nucleus is essentially going to have a net positive charge. And it's surrounded by a cloud of electrons. And these electrons have a net negative charge to for most solid materials, um, the nuclei essentially are in some fixed lattice structure, like a crystal structure, and they're not able to move. But in a liquid or gas, the nuclei can move. The electrons, of course, are much more mobile um, because they're in a cloud and they're moving around this fixed nucleus. So what happens if we put an electric field on this in this material, that, that we, we suddenly make our charge appear and we put an electric field that looks like this? Um, well, it's pretty obvious what's going to happen. We know that those electrons, which are negatively charged, are going to feel a force toward the positive charge creating the electric field. They're going to go against the direction of the arrow. So you're going to get some kind of motion that looks like that. The electrons are all going to shift that way. If the solid material is fixed, the positive charge can't move, but you might also get a push on the nucleus in a freely moving system in some direction away. So, so what happens in this case? Um, all of a sudden we've got a situation where we've got negative charge over here and positive charge over here. We know that that's going to create an electric field that's going to look something like that. It's going to push against the electric field that, that's come in. So in a lot of materials, you get a shifting of the charges within the atoms or the molecules that make up material that create an electric field that counter the electric field you applied. And we know by superposition, when we have two opposing electric fields, that the overall electric field is the sum of those. So we would expect, actually, that the electric field inside the material, let's call it E sub M out here, and let's define the electric field E sub S in space out here, we would expect that E sub M is less than the electric field in space because this material is pushing back against the electric field that separated the electron clouds from the nucleus. And you can see if you look in Coulomb's law that if, in fact because epsilon is in the denominator for materials that have a large epsilon you actually do get a reduction of the electric field the way we, we would think. And, and people don't like to deal with this. We'd like some kind of term that's sort of independent of the material um, because we don't really think unless we're going through a conductor our, our force rays should essentially change that much. So what we do to get around this is we define a new term. We either call a displacement vector or electric flux vector D, and D is simply equal to epsilon, the permittivity multiplied by the electric field. And we can see that when we set D equal to epsilon E, um, we just multiply the whole expression of Coulomb's law by epsilon, which creates an 
epsilon in the numerator, which cancels out with that term down there. And now d is completely independent of epsilon. The material you go through doesn't matter. And so, again, the way we think about this is that d is independent of material, but the electric field, the actual force vectors that push on other charges, are going to be reduced by an amount that's proportional to epsilon, the permittivity of the, the dielectric material we're going into. I want to explore one concept before we go on, and that's the concept of flux. What does it mean when we define something as an electric flux vector, and what is a flux? Because this is something we're going to be using a fair amount. Um, flux is the amount of something that goes through a surface. And in order to define this mathematically, we need to understand how to represent a surface mathematically. Well, well, one way to do it is the area of a surface, essentially how big it is. And I'm going to call that here delta A. Um, delta representing it's a tiny fraction of an area, sort of something we might use in calculus. Um, but nevertheless, we'll use A for area. Um, but the surface actually has a direction. Here we've got it oriented one way. Um, it would certainly be possible to write our surface essentially um, oriented in this way. So how do we mathematically represent the orientation of a surface? It turns out the only way to do it is by the vector that points perpendicular or normal to the surface. And we call that vector n. So here in this case the vector in is pointing normal to the surface. In the other surface I drew, in would point in that direction. So surfaces are defined by both areas, um, which I'm calling delta A, and a direction that's determined by the normal to the surface. And this is the, really the only way you can uniquely define a surface in space as a vector surface, is the vector that's normal to it. So what's flux? It turns out that flux is essentially the amount of stuff that goes through a surface. So if I've defined my, my vector field, my displacement or electric flux vector here, you'll see all the flux lines are going through that surface, delta A. Um, and we can see that there are the points that the lines intersect the circuit, surface. And if um, we think about this, the overall flux is simply going to be the density of flux lines multiplied by the area of the surface. But in the case that I were to tilt my surface, in other words, the surface normal is making some angle theta relative to the flux lines, um, when I do that tilting, you'll notice something. You'll notice that four of these rays still intersect the surface, but this ray up here and this ray down here are now missing the surface because of the way I tilted it. In order to account for that tilt, we define our flux as the, the flux vector d with the dot product of the area times the normal vector. And so in this case, if um, your flux rays are going in this direction and you tilt your surface from being basically catching all the rays and you rotate it 90 degrees so the surface is going that way, none of the rays are going to go through it because the flux vectors going this way are normal to the surface vector that way, and we know the dot product of two orthogonal vectors is equal to zero. So in short, we define our flux by a flux field, in this case d, we could also use e, with the dot product of a surface of area I'm calling delta a, and also defined in direction by the normal to the surface n, in which case the flux vector dotted with the normal times the area gives you the total flux through a surface. Okay, despite that little aside into mathematics and uh, defining flux, this is kind of an unsatisfying explanation of displacement or an electric flux vector because, because essentially what we're doing is we're defining a whole new term and it's not yet clear why we need that term. And, and this is actually a very difficult question to answer. Um, and it doesn't really satisfy intuitively what flux is or what epsilon is or anything like that. So, so let's zoom into our surface again and let's, let's look at the case where we have a lot of electric field vectors going through some kind of slab of material. Well, what we've learned is that there are atoms inside that material and these electric field vectors E are going to push on the nuclei, and the, if the nuclei can move, they're going to go that way, and they're going to pull on the electron clouds. That's the green part, and they're going to go that way. And it's going to produce electric fields that counter or oppose the electric field of the material. It turns out that what really happens is if you think about the whole material, you end up with net positive charges on this end of the material, because that's where the nuclei are, and net negative charges, which are represented by the green circles over on this end of the material. 
a good way to think about this and why the electric field reduces is that electric field lines begin on positive charges and terminate on negative charges. So in this case that you have a charge on the surface, um, you essentially create an opposite and opposing electric field and the field lines terminate on the surface charges and begin again on the other side of the surface as shown here. And so essentially while the overall electric field decreases, it's decreased because you've created a counter electric field inside this material. Um, now this is where things get tricky. It ends up to be really hard mathematically to work with fields that oppose each other in this way. So what people have done, and, and, and this is not intuitive but it's a trick, is they've essentially defined something called the polarization. And the polarization is defined by vector P. So now we have a third term. And instead of going from positive charges to negative charges, polarization goes from negative charges to positive charges, the opposite direction. So inside a molecule, the vector P points this way as that arrow shows. Overall throughout the material when you sum up all the molecules and all these individual little uh, separations you get an overall polarization of the material shown by the blue arrows that points from the negative charges to the positive charges. Now, th now this is very confusing but it's just the way it's done and the reason it's done is essentially we're going to now ha come up with a bunch of different definitions of the displacement vector. Um, we basically know that d is equal to epsilon e. Another way of writing this is essentially the permittivity of free space epsilon r or epsilon naught which is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter, that's the MKS units of it, plus the polarization P of the material where we recognize that the polarization is in the same direction as E but it's defined from negative charges to positive charges. A third way of writing this is epsilon naught times E which is the free space electric field plus epsilon naught times chi sub E which is determined which is called the electric susceptibility of the material. And this terminology actually comes from people who look at molecules or are interested in chi on a molecular scale. Um, so, so we can write this this way where we define 1 plus chi to be epsilon r which is called the relative permittivity of the material. So you end up with epsilon r equal 1 plus chi. And this definition of d is the most common one engineers because we don't really usually consider things on the molecular scale and don't work with susceptibilities use this sort of macroscopic property epsilon r and so you need to be familiar with this terminology there are a lot of ways of representing the same thing and people use them interchangeably um, but typically we'll stick with the relative permittivity to talk about a material and a typical relative permittivity is on the order of 2 to 5 for most materials. Uh, some of course can be much higher up in the the tens or even above 50. So I know all of this is very confusing but let's summarize. Uh, we know that the electric field is a force field vector given in volts per meter and it's related to the change in potential energy per distance per unit of charge and we learned that in potential. And we know that it changes with the permittivity of material. If the electric field goes into something, it's going to be reduced in a material that has high permittivity because the molecules essentially move to create an opposing field. Um, since energy is equal to force times distance, the electric field, which is a force field, has essentially units of energy per distance and we have to include the charge in there because it only pushes the other charges. D on the other hand is what's called a flux density vector and its value is given in coulombs per square meter, um, the amount of charge per unit area. And this is independent of the permittivity. So the electric field is a force vector that tells us what the force on other charges is. Uh, D is a flux vector, the amount of flux going through unit area which doesn't really change if we go into a material. I want to talk a little bit as we wrap up about why we have all these different representations of chi and the polarization P and relative permittivity to define D. Um, it's because 
a lot of people look at things on the mac microscopic level. If you want to know sort of what the permittivity of a material is, you've got to go down and do calculations on the scales of atoms and molecules. And it turns out that a lot of atoms and molecules essentially have um, a distribution of charges. We call them dipoles. So in this case, we have more positive charges on this end because you'll notice it's probably hard to see, but blue is positive, and in this representation, red is negative because that's the way the people who designed this this website where you can go and play with this if you want to uh, did the colors. It's sort of counterintuitive. So these charges have a negative end and a positive end, and this happens to be a water molecule. Um, you can look at more complicated molecules that also have similar things. It turns out that when you put an electric field on a molecule like this. For example, if you were to put an electric field across a glass of water, um, what's going to happen is that the molecule is essentially going to rotate in that electric field, so the negative charges are pulled that way and the positive charges are pushed that way. And so electric fields can actually cause the rotation of materials. Um, what happens if we put a bunch of these polar molecules, one that have a positive end and a negative um, end, in a crystal structure, like we freeze the water into ice or there's some kind of other thing that's polar. And what happens if that crystal structure doesn't align with our electric field, for example? So our electric field is going this way. Um, it turns out that in a lot of materials, uh, the motion of the charges doesn't necessarily go with the field. It's also constrained by the properties of the atom. So you may actually get a separation of negative charges this way, positive charges that way, which means the overall polarization vector, P, in the material is not lined up with the electric field that's causing those to shift. Um, this is not something we're going to get into. You need to be aware of it, because the reason we have all these different ways to represent the um, displacement vector, electric flux vector, is because in cases like this, chi and epsilon r aren't numbers. They turn out to be matrices. Um, and it turns out that there's a relation like this that says D doesn't point in the same direction as E. And this can result in all kinds of really interesting cutting edge stuff um, that will you will cover if you study this much later um, along in your life. But it's important to realize that some of this complexity arises because real materials are complex. They don't behave very nicely. But the things we're going to consider in the rest of these series does not treat epsilon as a tensor. It doesn't consider this. It only treats the relative permittivity of a number. And materials like this essentially are defined as being isotropic, that they're same in all directions. So let's summarize really quickly. What we've learned is that dielectric materials or insulating materials respond to electric fields by creating an opposing electric field inside them that comes from the distortion of the electron clouds within the, within the molecules or atoms that make up the material. In order to deal with this, we define a new vector deal phi that's related to E, and we call it the electric displacement or electric flux density. Um, we know the differences between E and D are that E is a force field that pushes on other charges. Um, and that, that force fields have units of energy per distance. It turns out that we're talking about potential energy with a charge with distance, so we define our electric field in terms of volts per meter. Uh, D is a flux density, and flux is the amount of something per unit area, so it has units of per unit area, as you can see right here, and it's simply the amount of flux rays from a charge per unit area, and it's independent of material. We also learned that there are many, many ways to express the properties of the material, because you know, materials really are pretty complicated things. Um, but the most commonly used in engineering is a relative permittivity. And for the sake of this series of lectures, we're going to treat the relative permittivity, epsilon r, as a number. Um, but it's not really a number in our materials. It can act in all materials. It can actually be a matrix and have lots and lots of complicated things. But we're not going to deal with that.